to the show. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Did you like that intro? Yes, classy. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got Trevor, we've got Logan, and we have a Mr. Carter from Carter, not custom, country meets. Country. Country. That's right. Yes. Well, welcome. Hey, welcome thanks. to the show, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks. We've known each other for since last year, a whopping one year it's been from about the a year. Yeah, yeah, year anniversary. Yeah. We met shooting at the Total Archery Challenge last year in Park City. Uh, I think it was you, me, Logan Sloaner was the Sloaner. Slurm. Slurm. He was there. Dudley, of course, the, the ultimate connector. Yeah. That guy's the glue that binds us all. He's the wind beneath my wings, you know? <laughs> yeah, really Mark, is. you just started shooting archery yeah. too, right? Not yeah, too just uh, last March, Dudley. Yeah. You know, he got me into it. He wanted to snowboard. I wanted to shoot archery, and I was like, cool, let's, uh, let's do a trade. That's fair. That and was a fun trip. That, yeah, it was great. Yeah, you were there. That was mm -hmm. the first time I met you up at, up at Brighton. Yeah. Oh, we seriously? Doing, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Stump was there, and we went, uh, we went and, uh, you know, Dudley. He's oh, talented. that's when you guys got yeah. dropped in the bird, right? They that, did. That, that was the second day. That was the second oh, day. The first okay. day was like, you know, kind of feeling it out, <sighs> make sure we don't kill John, because I know shoulders and arms are kind of important. So I was like, all right, let's... Why? Like, okay. Why are they important? I mean, it, he does some stuff, but right. it's irrelevant. Clean up but my that was my, space. like, my goal was just like, don't kill this guy because he's kind of big. You know, I'm like a midget, so it's like fine for me, but yeah, he we, falls I mean, harder he's a big than me. We got some good pictures representing that. We did. It looked like a circus act, but um, he he's, he's, act. he's talented, man. Like he picked that thing up pretty quick. He is a talented guy. We, yeah. we brought him out put a pistol in his hand for the first time that he's ever really shot a pistol. And we moved him back to 50 with a pistol and he was hitting six inch yeah. steel at 50 with a nine mil, uh, 2011 STI. Of course, like that's, I mean, yeah. of course <laughs> they're race car guns. They <laughs> shoot themselves. <laughs> they basically well, I think shoot he's themselves. just so good with technical and he like is. going through the, the, the process and, and well, yeah. his, his proper reception is great. Like, Andy right. and I ran into that when we were teaching him a skydive, too. Really? And he picked that shit up in a week. I'm like, <laughs> really? Mm, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is we had that conversation. Uh, I think it was Andy. Well, I think we did on a podcast. Mm -hmm. We were talking about what would John be if he would have joined the military. I was like, ah, he would have been a Delta guy. Yeah, he would have been a yep, Delta guy. He's an honorary cat guy. Yeah, he's an honorary cat guy. Because he's just like <laughs> fucking good at everything, loves to kill he's everything. He's like a giant human being, you know? <laughs> he's killed more white tail than you know what to do with. He really has. Uh, so, Mark, you have an interesting you have an interesting background. So a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh so what I know of you, which I, I've never really pried too much yeah, what into, do, what is do you know of background. Me? I, I didn't know you were a snowboarder <laughs> you other people until cry. well after tack, I thought. <laughs> I was like, somebody <laughs> was like, oh, well, he was a professional snowboarder. I'm like, really? I just thought he was like a rancher, He's like just, rancher guy, well, like cool dude. <laughs> also true, but. Yeah. yeah so I have a diverse portfolio. So tell us. Let's, yeah, let's hear I it. I mean. Let's go. Jeez, man. Where do I start? I start at the roots, I reckon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was born and raised, Ten Sleep, Wyoming, cattle ranch, like real deal. You know, my dad, four, four generations now with my, my brother's kids on it, um, working cattle ranch, not like the dude ranch or right. you know, big hat, no ranch. But Now, do you run on those dude ranches? Are you running dudes? Is that what? I on think those dude ranches? dudes are the people that want to come ride the horses that, that are, you know, and you'd be like, yeah, more people on the ranch, the better. But you're like, man, they just don't help. Right. Like if you didn't grow up around livestock, you don't understand. You're just going to be in the way. Like you don't understand your, right. your liability. So I grew up in my, my old man's a battle ax, man. He's like, like he just was kind of one of those guys, shorthanded, always, always bit off more than he could chew and would get the job done no matter what. It was just kind of like, you know, as a rancher, you you can't just be like, well, couldn't do it. I guess we got to go home. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, man, you like find a way to get the, like depending on whatever it is, there's always something you're like, this is so fucked. But you better find a way to get it done because, you know, you might have all these animals depending upon you. It might be a fucking water trough that needs fixed. But there was just so many of those instances in my life, like 
cattle battles, shorthanded, moving a bunch of cows. You know, he just taught us. He's like, you just do it. And I think a lot of times those old timers, you know, they just put their head down and work hard. Right. Not saying they didn't work smart, but that was just, that's the mentality. And so obviously like growing up, I would see that and then maybe bring a little bit of like, well, I'm going to think about how I don't have to work so hard. Right. <laughs> <'Cause> I'm, <laughs> I knew that I was like, man, I, I know I don't want to be a rancher at a kid, you know, because yeah. like you, it's, it's cliche to say, but like, you know, it's like, you'll thank me when you're older. Right. But now I'm like, oh, that was no bullshit, man. Like, you know, you learn how to take a beating early and what life is going to throw at you. And it's like, life's going to be a little bit easier. I reckon, you know, it's like, I can take a beating, you know? So like growing up on the ranch, we just, you know, ingrained that like amazing work ethic and just being around the animals and just being outside, no TV, just like kind of like that real connection to nature, which right. is so important. And I think what we've totally got away from with our phones and the cities and the asphalt and I think it's a huge problem with what's going on everything today. Nobody's really like looking at the stars or looking at the dirt. Everybody's like worrying about what everybody else is doing. Yeah, they're all like, they're all looking. Well, they're, right look, here, they're right? looking at some fake shit that's not even real, you know? Like your phone isn't a representation of like reality. It's just like, it's what you think you want it to be. And until you're actually out there in the present and grateful for what you actually do have, then like, you need a toothpick, dude? I got one right oh, here. Oh, no, bro. You got, you got the good ones? Yeah, you got, got the good good? I got some the, rich people shit. Fancy okay. Ones. Yeah, have one okay. of those. These are- have one of those. You chew on that for, you know, a couple days if you really want to. Is this going to alter my state of mind? No. Okay, okay, just checking. Cowboys <laughs> don't do weed. Okay. They don't. Interesting. I've known a few that do. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, um, oh, man, this is nice. But yeah, you know, it was a, uh, it was a man so grateful to grow up in, in kind of a, a tough place. And dad, sure. dad wasn't like, how are your feelings today? I was like, your dad did how, check how in on you your feelings. Today, you know, my dad told us, he yeah. gave us like a lot of responsibility at a young age. Thank God my mother is a saint. She like gave us, you know, the nurture, like she nurtured us and, 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 you know, there was that side, but my dad was tough. He was just like, I had boys to have free labor. Yeah, the kids yeah, are like, yeah. oh man, awesome summer vacation. What are you doing for your summer vacation? I was like, fuck, I'm working, <laughs> you know? Vacation. But, you know, we were pretty wild too. And, and growing up in a town of like 260 people, there was really no law. Well, there was law, but our, our football coach was our town sheriff. Right. And so, you know, if you got in too much trouble, he wouldn't, you, you couldn't play football. And that was a big deal. So you just didn't get in trouble. <laughs> you know, he's just like, uh, you know, kind of, but the way it should be, you know, we, we never were really like too out of hand. And if we were, he would have reel us in. But as far as, um, just hammering you and giving you tickets, it just wasn't. Get pulled wasn't, over and he's like, you know what? Go run a lap. Well, he'd be like, Hey, if you guys get too drunk, call me and I will take you home. Right. He was worried about our safety and not about right. like, cause we were fucking coyotes, man. Sweet, like we yeah. were wild. Yeah, but um, sure actually wanted to serve and protect. Yes, and my dad told me when I was thirteen years old. Well, maybe I was younger than that. He goes, "The nights may be yours, but the days are mine." <laughs> <laughs> and I was just I like, like that. And, it, and and man, we'd go out all night and do stupid shit. And then first thing in the morning, man, we were up moving sprinkler pipe, and and I'm puking and letting the mosquitoes feeding the mosquitoes, and it was tough, but it was great and it was a great upbringing and it taught me like, you know, like I said, how to take a beating. And I think that's how I rolled that over into snowboarding. Um, because the first thing you want to learn is how to wreck. <laughs> like with anything, well, if you're going to get good at something, you better learn how to wreck. But how, how do you make that transition from a really small town and how do you even start snowboarding? Cause where is it? How, how close is the nearest mountain to you? Guys? Well, Luckily, we had a little resort right, you know, 15 miles from Tent Sleep. Oh, and wow. It was called okay. Metal Arc. Right. Um, and it was just a palm lift. It was super tiny. And right. on Fridays, the school would take us up for like $3 for a lift ticket. And, and I was, man, I was always infatuated with snow because I remember as a kid, the, like one of my favorite things to do was dad would go check the cows and he'd pull us behind the truck in sleds. And I just remember just being like, this is like the sliding or whatever it was. Right. And then sometimes like we'd be on the fields, he'd be checking cows on his horse and he'd just dally off. And I'd be like, 
you know, can I, we pull me around right. and he just pull us through the field on a sled. And like, I remember first airtime ever, there'd be like frozen cow turds out there and he'd hit one hard, you know, and you'd catch some air. No, no transitional landing. He's not really good for the back, but I was like, I like this. So I knew I'd like <laughs> yeah. to slide on snow and then transitioning into, uh, going up on, on Fridays, the school would take us up the bus you go half day. And that was where it clicked for me. And I skied first. Cause I mean, this is like 1987. And so snowboarding wasn't re- especially in a place like that. Snowboarding wasn't even there except for right. one guy. There's a guy, Charlie Hicks. He's still there riding. He's like, was my mentor. He's this awesome character. But I remember like just seeing him ride down the mountain and he had this big Husky dog and he was snowboarding. He was the only snowboarder. And I was like, that guy's having way more fun than everybody. Like, what's he doing? I want to do that. So I begged my parents. Finally, like, I was fortunate enough that I got a snowboard, and he taught me and my sister Gabby and RC, my brother, how to how to snowboard. And a bunch of the kids around that area. So we were. That was kind of like the first spark of snowboarding for me, and that was like, man, I was in. So that's where I started. How old were you when you started? I was like nine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pretty young. Nine. Yeah. Nine. I'll get you off from that. Yeah. Yeah. And I already knew how to wreck really good. Cause I mean, I like how, when you were nine years old, you're like, that dude's rad. (laughs) (laughs) I knew it was up. I knew it was up. I was like that guy, like fun. And I was always craving fun. Cause there's a lot of stuff we did that wasn't fun. Right. Like feeding the cows and fucking moving sprinkler pipe and fucking chopping weeds. My dad loved to have us chop weeds. And, now he's like, I just keeping you guys busy. He did, like, we'd go down ditches in the middle of the summer with machetes. And that was cool because we had machetes. Yeah. But we'd have to chop the weeds out of the ditch, you know, so the water would flow. Yep. And it was just bullshit. It was just busy work. You yeah. Know? Skeeters eating you. He's just like, hey, boys, go, uh, go chop the weeds. Uh, yeah, okay. For dad. Go chop the weeds. Yeah. Ah, busy work. Yeah. He loved the busy work, but it was good. And then, you know, he was such a cowboy and we, and like, it was a different time and like horses, Horses were a lot honorier. Like they, they hadn't bred the dumb out of all of them. And so he was all about these wild freaking horses. And he always had these bucking horses around. And he was like, and I wouldn't say that he was putting us on the rank horses. He was usually riding them. But I remember more than once, like getting airmailed first thing in the morning. And like, there's nothing like getting on a horse in the middle of nowhere. And it's cold and the sun isn't up. And you get on him and you feel that hump in his back. And you're just like, you're just a little scared kid and you're like, you know, he's going to buck and you don't know when, but like, it's going to happen. Right. And then you just get bucked off. And the, the thing about getting bucked off is like, you, it's not like you're, Oh, we're done for the day. You're like, you got to get back on him. Right. And so I remember mornings of just like, God damn it. This fucking horse. Gonna buck me off and cry a little bit. And I'm gonna get back <laughs> on him. My dad's going to chew my ass. But uh, yeah, it was good. And then, Yeah, snowboarding, you know, I just got really into that. And my mother, they were divorced. So my mom lived in, um, in Casper, Wyoming. And so that's where I actually moved and learned that you could grab your board and there was style in snowboarding. Right. It'd been like two years in, there was was actually a snowboarding scene and culture. And I met, I fell in with the right people and, um, they, you know, I, I realized that there was like a whole industry and that was where I was like, maybe I want to be a pro snowboarder. I was like, this is cool. But I just didn't have the time, you know? I mean, my mom, when I lived with her, she would she would nurture that and support that. But when I lived with my dad, it was just like metal art. So I bounced like, dude, from third grade to junior year in high school, I just was like moving two, three times a year, back and forth, back and forth. Wow. And I think my life's still like that. <laughs> but um, I was able to, you know, really, I, I put my eye on the prize early, but then I just totally got off path, like living intensely. And, and then there was nothing else to do. So I had, I was playing football because like right. in a small community, like they need all the numbers. And so there, there was huge pressure to play football and I didn't want to play football because I was like a skater. And I mean, as a rancher, I was a skater. I was really confused. I guess you would call it. <laughs> it was like skating and ranching. I got my ear pierced in fifth grade. Like you go to tent sleep and they're looking <laughs> they're at like, you kind of funny. Like they had a word for that. And you know, yeah. they were just like, yeah, you know, it wasn't right. that like, <laughs> <laughs> flattering and <laughs> but I didn't care I was just always kind of an oddball and but I knew that like I was I was a pretty tough kid because like growing up on the ranch you know like I wouldn't take no shit but 
I just kind of like bounced between those two worlds for a while. And then I got a totally away from snowboarding um, early in high school because I was just fully living intensely playing football. And then I started lifting weights and getting all swole. Oh, yeah. Then I was pretty good at football. And then I had a college scholarship to play football at a small school. And I'll never forget, like, I went to school and was like, what am I doing? I hated school. I hated school. But what, I liked football. And I went to college, had the scholarship. And I remember, like, I was trying to hang out with the jocks playing football. But my friends I wanted to hang out with were, like, were, like smoking weed and going fishing. I was like, man, this is, like, August in South Dakota. I was like, I want to go play I'm gonna go fishing, dude. This is like I'm over getting yelled at my whole <laughs> life by coach that doesn't care. Like our team sucks, and so uh, that winter, like early, I was still going to school in 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 South Dakota, and I got a season pass to this resort, and I literally hadn't snowboarded in three or four years, and I still had this old gear. It was like so outdated, and I went and rode one day, and I was like, dude, what have I been doing? I'm such an idiot. I need to get back into this like this path. I remembered. And so I dropped out of school and I remember like dropping out of school. It, like my dad wasn't surprised. Like everybody knew I didn't want to go to school, but I told my dad, I was like, Hey, I'm going to drop out of school. I kind of got a plan. He goes, you know, he gave me some advice that like stuck with me. It gave me security. He's like, you know, you'll always be okay if you know how to work hard. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. So I'm just going to work hard. at something right. I want to do. So I uh, dropped out, worked for a year on the ranch, just him and I. My brother was in college and just put the plan of like going somewhere and snowboarding for a whole winter and not working. And so I did that, moved to Bozeman the next winter and just like was a full bum, ate ramen noodles and snowboarded and started like honing my skills back and spent two winters in, in Bridger up in uh, Bozeman riding that place. And then my friends like it came full circle back to cat, my friends from Casper and they had moved to Jackson, which is like the Mecca. And I didn't even know that man. Like right. I'd never even been to Jackson. Like it's in Wyoming, but it was kind of like California, you know? Yeah. Jackson's yeah. not part of no Wyoming. No. And it's even like, back it's, then it was it's like, like California. It's like, in Wyoming, it's like, right? it's like, Bozeman, it's like no. Texas and California. Yeah. In Wyoming. It was like, yeah. it was this like, but it was, it's so, it was so beautiful. I remember going there and I was like, holy beautiful. shit, this resort's here. And like yeah. my friends worked on the park crew, Forsberg and Agna. And they were like, man, we'll get you a job. And I was like, 725 an hour. I like those odds. And, so, <laughs> and I, I was the dirt bag. Dude. I lived in a car. I could move, I could move myself in an hour, pack everything I own, my air mattress right. and be. And so that's where I like, you know, I got to Jackson. It was like, I, this was home. I didn't have to leave Wyoming and the mountains were like the, the level that I wanted to ride. And like Jackson was blowing up with Travis Rice and all these guys were there, but it still wasn't on the map because like in that era, and I kind of dropped in late, you know, cause I was like 22 at this point. And in the industry at that point, like you were, if you didn't have your career like full on, because like people were washed up by 28 or 29 in that, that era of like snowboarding and it was totally changing. Well, and that was kind of pre like big mountain stuff where. Yeah. Big mountain like, wasn't cool. Yeah. You know, was, there was guys, the cool there was do. guys doing it and had been doing it. Yeah. But it's it was like all about park and pipe and like this like this whole scene and it was cool and that's what I thought I wanted to do. But Jackson wasn't the scene. But man, I fell in love with the mountains and I found mentors like Gooch and and Travis and Willie and Lance and all these guys that were like, no nah, man, this is like this is the path. Like you want to, and then just <clears throat> the industry evolved and like just kind of really focused on that. What, what year was that? Like years, I should say. Uh, I'd say like really really started happening 2004 and then that started going like jeremy jones like split boarding a little bit closer split boarding and um yeah and thank god like i was you know i didn't get my first paycheck in snowboarding until i was like 27 really and so that was like you were washed up during that time but it evolved and i was able to just kind of ride that wave and then even to this day you know it's totally changed and now it's like all about the the older guys and and there's a lot more respect and value because I mean you it, it, when you're dealing with mountains and that kind of terrain and just that world and navigation you really like the more experience you have the better obviously because you have to really have your finger on the pulse and, yeah and it's not like park or anything else where it's like you can just fall like there's no yeah. recovery on a big ass peak yeah like, your if decisions you just fall. Yeah, your decision making, and especially with a team, you know, if you're in the park, it's you. You're not you're not navigating. And I mean, you guys know, like 
you're, you're, you're strong as your weakest link and everybody right. needs to come home. And so like when you're going out there, you have this, like you have a plan, you're, you're going to execute it. You're going to like make the right decisions. And like, you know, there's you really no like making those critical errors. Yeah. And so the more knowledge and more experience you have with navigating and riding these lines and, you know, knowing when to like push the limits and knowing when to pull back is super important. And that's what like the older guys and, and really that have that experience has been just huge, you know, like Brian Aguchi. I mean, he's been my mentor and nobody moves through the mountains like him, you know, and we're able to really get into the shit when the conditions like allow us to, you know, right. but we list mother nature, like dictates everything. Like yeah. you just sit back, you don't force anything. you be patient, but when it's on, like you better strike and get it. And then when it's off, you're just, you just know, you just pull back. But it's, it's interesting, man. I, I love, I love just like riding those big mountains and being out there. And most of the access we do is on snowmobiles. So that's, that's cool too. Camping at the trailheads in our campers and just, punching in and just really watching the weather avalanche conditions. And yeah, I, 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 it's so sick. I don't quite understand how uh, people make a living in snowboarding, to be honest with you. Not a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's like, I think that the main, the main source of income would be, you know, more than like, being pro snowboarders, we're, we're ambassadors right. these days for brands. Right. And so you're affiliated with the brands and they pay you to collect assets and just be a great representative <clears throat> of the brand. And, you know, I'm in a place where I got to kind of like choose what I want to do, choose product projects. And that's what's kind of evolved with the industry. It used to be like you would film with one production company and your sponsor would give them all the money and then you had to produce a video part. And then the magazines that were like taking photos as you were producing the video part, you'd have an interview or stuff in magazines. But now it's changed. Like it's totally, we've taken it into our own hands, which is really cool through right. social media and, and sponsors that like support your projects. You're like, I want to do this. Right. Uh, and, and it gives you like a purpose through the winter to go and like ride new things and push the limit um, but not have the pressure of like some dude telling you what you have to do. Right. Yeah. Which is nice. Cause I mean, we make the calls on everything. No, that's awesome though, that you would be like, I'm going to do this epic thing. Yeah. Do you want to be a part of this? Do you yeah. want to support me through this? Yeah. So it, yeah. It's really just, you know, what, what are you doing to push the limits and the boundaries on this activity? And then, you know, how, how much creativity can you have to go do an activity that, Hundred percent. Nobody else has done. Hundred percent. And having like the really, I mean, dude, like North Face. I've been with the North Face for um, twelve years. Like wow. global ambassador with those guys. Seriously? I mean, they've really stuck by me. Yeah. Like Arbor Snowboards. Um, I've been with them for five. So like, it's and then Yeti's been huge. Just in like getting. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys if it wasn't for Yeti. You know, they really bridged the gap for me. You know, I was like very core snowboarding industry, but Yeti's come in and. And they, th their group of ambassadors is so diverse and just putting right. people together. And they're like very like-minded people. Um, and just like, but Dudley, he's like, yeah, you know, we met at a summit, a Yeti summit. He's like, you're a snowboarder. I, I think I like snowboarding. I was like, right. do you? Like, like, I think I like archery. We should, <laughs> <Lob skills. laughs> we should, we should do something. But, um, just having that like freedom to pick what I do and have my sponsor support and they trust um, that's why they pay me. They know I'm going to produce good stuff and, and I have a creative, a creative team that we're working with and, and I'm just going to be in the mountains and, and, and really like giving an authentic perspective into what we're doing. And I, I don't force things and I have a unique, uh, a unique look at, I don't know, take on things just because, you know, I am a Wyoming boy and there's not a, a ton of Wyoming boys that have, I don't know of any ranchers that are doing this at this level, which is kind of cool. You know, I have a, but I don't know. I always go back to the, I always go home. I always go to 10 sleep in the summers to just go right. dig back in. And not that I work every day, you know, I don't want to be a rancher like full time, but it's fun. Like anything we do with the cows, like my dad has a bunch of cows in Southern Wyoming. I'm always like involved in like that stuff, which I really enjoy. Um, and just seeing how people work, man. It's like, it's like a hard living and just, it's humbling. You know, I'm very fortunate to just like, get a snowboard for a living. It's like even the hard days, even dangerous. You're just like, dude, 
snowboarding. So snowboarding <laughs> really <laughs> it keeps the lights on right now for you. Is that yeah, right? for sure. That's, like I make my, my full, it's my career. Yeah. Yeah. And like the ranch, I don't pull anything from ranch, but we, we have, so my brother and I started our Carter country meats, our yeah. beef business selling direct from the ranch like seven years ago. And it's evolved right. like tremendously. It's like growing, which has been great. So that's cool. I really, it's like building a business as you know, it's like, you know, you like plant the seed and you like water it and you start seeing it grow. And then there's nothing more rewarding than like feeding something that, that people really want and like. Yeah. It's not like selling a, like a piece of wood to somebody. You're like, right. here's a piece of wood. Pretty cool, huh? Here's a two by four. Can't eat it, <laughs> yeah. but it's cool. Yeah. Well, like selling food to people, like really good product is just like so rewarding. When people are like, man, you know, I had a steak years or that was so good. Or being able to like donate to a foundation, people actually are hungry. You know, um, it's been, it's been a cool path, like growing that company and, and like bringing, like you met Sean and, mm -hmm. and, and at, or you didn't, yeah, Asher, we had our first event yeah. at the TAC, at the TAC and, you know, yeah. and like seeing it evolve and like being able to bring my connections from snowboarding and all these amazing like experiences and people that I've met and bring them into my company now right. and like hire them has been all time, you know? So that's, it's, uh, it's been a cool road and, you know, just kind of continuing that is my idea. Like really trying not to work a ton would be I ideal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but just like working towards things I want to do. It's like, man, that busy work. I had enough of that shit as a kid. And like, like dude, I don't want to chop weeds anymore. Yeah. Busy work is, uh, it's interesting because I, I find a lot of people try to do a lot of busy work because they want to fill up the time. You know, you see it in the company all the time. You have to keep, you have to tell people, I would prefer you just not show up to work yeah. and like come in here and waste a bunch of fucking company time. Well, and it's really a, a modern problem, right? I think it is. I, mean, I don't think, I, I don't think as we were hunter gatherers back in the day that we, like statistically, I think the cadence of the day has been proven where people would sleep more. They would spend more time socializing. They, yeah. Well, I think you know, they've had, they've had some studies out where they've, they've seen that people were doing like, 15 to 20 hours of work in a seven day week. Yeah, yeah that's like about total, right. You know, and yeah. Yeah. you break that down and maybe two of those days are five hour days and then you're spreading out the rest of the five hours over the course of four more days. Like, Well, I mean, I. back then, man, you only had one problem when you're hungry. Yeah. More yeah. food. You're either cold or you're hungry. So man. you solve those problems or you want to fuck. So... <laughs> I'm cold, I'm hungry, and I want to fuck. So like so two, that's like two, those are three, three problems. <laughs> <laughs> so those are just the problems I want to have. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. I'm cold, I'm hungry, <laughs> I'm horny. That's yeah, it. That's it. Just keep it simple. Keep it simple. That's even, that's not even K-I-S-S. -S. That's just the three H's. That's <laughs> K-I-S. <laughs> keep it simple. I think if you, if you can wake up and those are your three problems, then man, you're, you're crushing it at life. Yep. Throw your phone in the river. And have those problems and you're good to go. That, that's my dream. That's when I know that I've made it is when I just fucking delete every account that I have. And it's like, all I have is like a flip phone where my kids can call me and be like, what's up? What's going on? It's that's old it. man. Get I will know if I, I have officially made it. When you guys see that fucking Motorola razor mm. come out of my pocket, you're going to be like, this motherfucker made it. My, made mom, it. my mom rolls, <laughs> rolls the G-Shock. I think it's a G. What's the waterproof flip phone? It's like the, oh. it's one of those. Yep. She won't. She won't have an iPhone. I was like, I envy you. Yeah. Everybody's like, get an iPhone, mom. Why? Why? For what? I don't like your technology. <laughs> so in the winter time, what's your what's your schedule, man? Like, are you traveling? No. A ton or you where, know, do you just um, like camp on one hill? I, I will travel. I mean, I try to base mainly out of Jackson because I love to sleep in my own my own bed. At right. night, I have a sweet, my, my friend Razy has this amazing house in Jackson and she's, she's on the US ski team. So she's gone like most of the winter. And so I just kind of caretake and live That's there badass. and have a sauna in my bathroom, which is super, super chill, especially for those negative 25 days. Right. But, and, and I mean, all the terrain around Jackson is just what I, there's so much exploring to do and the resort there is insane. So like m m roughly like in December, I'll roll in maybe end of November, just kind of depending on the snowpack, start doing some touring 
which is like split boarding, walking uphill, putting your board together, riding down, getting the legs in shape. And then the resorts, when the resort opens, I'm pounding laughs at the resort in December. Like I love December because I just get a ride. There's no right. pressure. We're not starting to film. I just want to get my legs under me and ride a ton, get my base <laughs> strength dialed. Um, and then once the snowpack kind of permits us to, we'll start like getting on the sleds and, and venturing out. I mean, we didn't even film till February last year, just because we had a oh, wow. really, we had a really sketchy snowpack when we were getting a lot of snow and it was really dangerous. And so like even messing with it was just like, eh, I was in no hurry, you know? That's right. It was like, it was super real, sketchy. real cold, lots of snow, real warm, real cold, lots of snow, real warm. We had this like layer down <clears throat> really deep, like basically at the ground. So it come in in like October, we'd got a snow and then it sat there and just rotted and then just rotted and rotted. And then so everything that fell on top of that was like whoosh, sliding. And so the more load it got on it, it was just like, and especially it, there, there's a tipping point with like the snowpack, right? And it's like, it takes, you know, there's, there, it can, you can be a total nerd into it, like snow crystals and like right. everything. But when that snow came in and rotted and sat there, it created this really bad like first layer. And so until you got like, 200 cm of compaction on that like the right snowpack to just make it go to sleep it was just ripping out and is really twitchy and like any like human trigger would like you would die right and so through january we were just riding the resort which was totally fine because they control the resort right um they blast for it they blast they control i mean those guys like you go up the tram at jackson and you get off in the middle of the gnarliest storm it's dumping. It did three feet overnight. And you're literally at 10,000 feet right. with the craziest train. And you're like, it's it's not safe, but it's like safe enough to open it to 2,000 people. It's not right. unpredictable. So like the ski patrol is so like, it baffles me every time that they can go open that up. Like do their bombing runs in the morning and continue to keep the shit fairly safe for, I mean, there will be fatalities very rarely, but inbounds that'll happen. Right. But like, I, I'm like baffled at the work those guys do and are able to open a place like that during, in those conditions. Like you get off and you're like, I can't even believe this is open today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when it's like that, it's really good. Right. Cause it's deep, you know, it's deep. So just riding that is, I mean, that resort, just like, that's what really honed me into an amazing rider. And everybody when you've ridden, there. I would imagine in a ton of these resorts. Yeah, I've been like, all over. Been it, all over. I've been all over, all over the world, you know. And yeah. uh, Jackson still is where I hang my hat because right. I, I love, I love it. It's home. It's Wyoming. Um, the summer I dip hard. I'm out, but in the winter, it's it's just like the only place I want to be. And then you know the resort can be busy, but the way we film. Like when we started in, in February is we have like within a hundred mile radius, there's mountains everywhere and we're watching the snowpack and how it's coming in and the train we want to ride. And we have, you know, we know a lot of it cause we've reconned it. We wrote it. We're opening up new stuff, but we just go to trailheads. I have like a sweet four wheel pop-up camper in the back of my truck, mm -hmm. pop that thing up. I'm home. have my little, my little Traeger, my goal zero, yeah, like yeah. cook it outside. And then we have our sleds. And so Gooch and I'll just pop up and then you'll have a filmer, photographer, maybe another rider. And, um, yeah, you're just there. You immerse yourself in the mountains and just do work, you know, but you watch those windows, those high pressure windows coming and then you better like you strike. And then, cause you can't be out there filming. The footage looks like shit anyways, if it's not sunny. Got it. Yeah. But when it, in January and February, when like when it's sunny, it's cold. Yeah, it's like clear. it's cold. Like we were going out. We did this whole trip, like a five day trip. We had a high, five day high pressure end of January or beginning of February. And it was, and I mean, I remember waking up in the morning and like getting on my sled and it was negative 25. You're like <laughs> doing some river dick. In the day. <laughs> <laughs> negative 25 oh, is dude. no fucking joke. It's yeah, it's cold. It's cold. And just being out there all day, like it gets squirrely. Ugh. I think we were bullshitting about that in January. Yeah, it, it's hard. Yeah. yeah, and getting you know Trevor, he he's he, we got him on the board this year. Oh, was this your first year on a yeah. snowboard? Yeah, I saw him skiing last year, and I was like, dude, don't like, do that's don't not do happening that. anymore. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. That was literally no, no, no. That's <laughs> no, no. You're done. <laughs> yeah, because I think we were talking. I was like, ah, I don't know. I haven't snowboarded mm -hmm. since I was in. I don't know, probably college or whatever. And believe yeah. it or not, I I used to tele ski. Yeah, 
Whoa, dude. Go ahead and age yourself there. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, yeah. Telly ski dog. Wow. Free the knee. Free free the heel. Free the heel, bro. Free Free the heel. heel. Sorry. Free heel. No, no, no. It's free free the heel, heel, destroy the knee. Yeah. (laughs) That's how telly skiing works. It looks like so much work. Well, that's why I I liked it. Because you like lunges. Exactly. Just getting those glutes all swole. My That's morning routines, like uh, in, uh, when I would go out and do this, where I would skin up and ski down, skin up, ski down, skin up, ski down. So I'd do like two runs in the morning, two runs in the where afternoon. Where were you? It depends. Like I where I had a uh, like a really shitty condo in McCall, Idaho. Okay, I yeah, just, yeah. I would two runs in the morning, two runs in the evening. Well, I mean, it's gr- it makes you strong. It feels good. No, my my legs were just fucking like. You know, and, they and, were they were the best shape of my life coming off of like six weeks of doing that in McCall, like every day. And I I would do these trips. I'd go from Colorado. I used to have a place uh, just outside of Boulder. And there's a tiny little ski hill outside of Netherland, Netherland. Um, Netherland, Colorado, which doesn't get a lot of doesn't get a lot of traffic. So I could ski up there. But I literally the only reason I did it was for the fucking lunges. That was it. Wow, like, you're that was getting it. lunges. <laughs> and then you you fucking turn a ski wrong coming down a hill, oh. and it tweaks your knee a few times. Super After a few you. times of that, you're like, this tele skiing is fucking dumb. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. do something different. Well, um, and like we had that conversation like, oh, no, I started skiing because I was doing ski-based mountaineering. Like I wanted to be able to Same. skin up and yeah. climb and do that Same. sort of stuff. And you're like, oh, dude, the technology has come so far since well, you learned to ski that's what, 12 that's what years we ago. Like, last, you need to stop yeah. skiing. You're an idiot at this point. Last year, that's what we were talking about because that's exactly I was talking yeah. to Mark. It's like, hey, I, like, I can't ride scenario. a snowboard because I, yeah. I, I like to fucking get my skins hit the fuck mountains, wear a backpack, and you're like, find out it's bullshit. Hey, well, it's like, hey, you can do this on a board. Yeah. Like, really I mean, well. I mean, I mean, like, like, we were... Back like, in the day, man, you'd put a split board on, there's like an inch gap, and yeah, that shit would it like... It didn't work. I mean, it's come <laughs> so far. It well, and, like, and now, like, I've done some, a few skins up with, with Sean and Asher, and, you know, I'm like, oh, well, we're going the same speed as all the skiers. Like, yeah, I'm never going back. Like, yeah. This is so insane. Where, where, I mean, there's definitely gives and takes, you know, like, if, like, don't get me wrong, like, Skiing is, I mean, I have a lot of like r- really good friends or professional skiers. It's gnarly. Yeah. Like those guys, like just even filming, like the level they have to go compared to my level every day to get a shot. I'm just like, mm-hmm. what do you mean? Like, how- just the shit they have to do. You have to go really? way bigger, way faster. Like, right. you know, I mean, you granted, you have hard boots and, and four edges. And, right. but just filming with those guys, like over the years, I'm like, oh, I'll just ride that like surfy wave and slash it a few times, do an air and a 360. And, and I'm, they're like, where's the biggest cliff? <laughs> that, that I I'm can like, do a 720 <laughs> off of. I mean, just, it's different. You know, it's different. I mean, obviously their, their equipment helps them with that. And, um, and, it, and it's awesome. It's like, man, whatever gets you in the mountains and like puts a smile on your face. I'm just like, I'm down. I love to talk shit on skiing just because it's like, it's fun to talk shit. Yeah. But I, I don't really mean it, but I kind of do. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, yeah, like the, the touring capabilities, like if I was going to cramp on up some gnarly shit, which I have before, it'd be way better to have like a hard ski boot on. Right. If you're like a serious, like mountaineer, all you want to do is go uphill and skiing's probably for you. Right. If you enjoy that, but you want to have a good time on the way down, you should probably snowboard. Because yeah. snowboarding is strictly recreation. Travel, like skiing, s- snowboarding has. You, skiing you is can't, a form like, of transportation. You, well, in it some is, ways, and then right? that, that it's, it's like, the oldest form. You know, yeah. is in Europe, those guys do gnarly traverses in in Europe, and like the crazy shit those guys are doing. But I mean, snowboarding is, and and that's what appealed to me. Like back to like Metal Arc when I first saw somebody snowboarding. Well, we also ask that you lay a special blessing with all of our. Men and women serving our United States military and all of our first responders. We recognize the military no matter where we go or what we do. That's just, we always have. And uh, make sure that they know that they are appreciated, that we really know the sacrifices that they and their fellow brothers and family have made. I saw that. I didn't know anything about skiing or snowboarding, but I saw Charlie coming down the mountain. I was like, that dude's having way more fun. Like floating, planing out yeah. in powder is just like nothing. Like there's no feel that you 
get maybe other than like surfing or something, but it's just. But even the uphill traffic, like there's very little that I can look at and see that I've say done on skis yeah. that fitness won't fix yeah. while using a split board. Yeah. There's very mm-hmm. little. And, and, right. and, you know, I just, those, those places and those routes aren't places that necessarily I would ever want to ski or board. Because I don't know if my level will ever be there. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's like, yeah, I would go climb that mountain, mm-hmm. but I would be wrapping through those sections, yeah. not boarding or skiing yeah. down those sections. So for me, like for me, or I'm sure maybe for you, it's like, whatever. Start splitting, having fun on the way down. Yeah, yeah man. Just, well, I'm less concerned these days. Like, you know, well, I'm, I'm like in my... You know, when I was in my 20s, like the only thing I really wanted was like superhuman strength, right? That's what I really was concerned about. Be super I didn't give a fuck about having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my life was not about fun at that point, right? No, that's about, what you were telling A little Marky. bit of fun. <laughs> a little bit. It's like... So you're telling Marky, man. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Well, that's where like all the hippies tellied, right? Yeah. So then, you know, I, I'm like this fucking CIA you know, telly guy, can't commando telly guy going to other you're hippies. Literally, <laughs> you're literally hey, so, their worst enemy. <laughs> yeah, hey man, so how do you do this shit anyway? And it's like all these crusty hippies in like in Colorado showing me how to telly, and it's such a weird story because do, do for a living. Well, <laughs> well, no, I was like I was trying to teach myself how to telly. I was trying to teach myself how to telly from a book. Oh. So I was like a fucking. <laughs> I was a fucking yard sale. That's like I was a yard sale, like on every fucking. Did you ever have mountain. like a serious knee injury? Uh, not really. Damn. Because it's got I mean, a low it's, center it helps gravity. not have long legs. Well, yeah. when you're when, when it, and I would I would attest to this in the sense of like I knew how to train myself, right? Like crawl, walk, run. Yeah. And so I'd be on the bunny hill with all the fucking kids that are like five years old with these telly skis with a book in my hand, <laughs> like trying to figure this out, how to turn and shit. And it was so stupid looking. And finally, I met this chick and she took pity on me. She's like, okay, dude, I'm going to take pity on you in two ways. I'm going to teach you how to telly ski and I'm going to let you inside me. And I was like, this is a, <laughs> this is a good deal. <laughs> Perfect scenario. <laughs> She's like, ah, perfecto. She's oh like, you know what? God, I'm sick of you hitting children, so oh I'm going to teach God. you how to ski. Yeah, yeah. Also, you're attractive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're like, I love telemarking. Oh, yeah. So, this whole telly thing is awesome. It's it right. Yeah, shakes. no wonder you fell in love with teleskiing. <laughs> now it makes sense. Oh, I didn't fall in no. love. I didn't fall in love with that teleskiing. I just kind of. Used it as a means of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Just slid, <laughs> right in, slid right down that Just hill. Used right it down. as a means of transportation, boys. I'm a utilitarian at heart. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so, that's good. Yeah, it. But now I take my kids out there. You know, transition away from like my whatever stories. But it's like now my kids, three and six, are both like ripping little skiers, skier skiers. Yeah. And, uh, and the only reason they're skiers is because my wife and I do not have the capabilities to teach our kids how to ski, right? But we had a, a babysitter last year that was a ski instructor, like a kid's ski instructor for like a decade. Perfect. So she was like taking the kids up. Perfect scenario. And they are so fucking good. We're already at, paying you. Like they're, so. they're great at six. And my little three-year-old, she's great. But I can't wait because now, now it's about more fun, right? How do I have fun? Uh, and we had a blast. My wife and I had a blast. We did snowboards last year. Awesome. And like it was just, it was just so much fun, especially Salt Lake. So accessible. Yeah. Easy. Easy well, peasy. Like how many ski hills are up in? Well, there's probably half dozen. How many? Is there only one in Jackson? There's, is it the there's one? like, okay, so Snow King is right in town and then jackson mountain resort right is out, out like kind of 12 miles out of town and then over the pass from that another hours grand targhee so there's three. okay there's three but i'm all about like those big resorts are cool but man like growing coming from like the small resort like metal right. these misty little mom and pop yeah dude there's 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 some cool resorts like uh i think it's pine creek uh, out of cokeville what yeah dude cokeville pine creek that place is sick Seriously? Quad 
and go rip. Like, Nobody there. Roll. It Nobody reminds me of home. There. Everybody's wearing Carhartts, like just just doing it for the right reasons. They're like, man, we like to slide down the hill. There's no there's no ego. Right. Like you uh, you find a lot of these big resorts, like especially like Jackson. You know, everybody's like, "How big's your dick?" What'd you do today? See, that's how and you I'm know. Just, you, if you dude. can pull into the resort parking, it's not full. It's full of mostly pickup trucks yes. and not Audis. All right. Just getting there. Probably not going to have a problem here. Bailing twine in the back of the truck. You just, <laughs> just got done feeding. Like flatbeds. Yeah. 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 That's what's up, man. Dog hanging that out. That guy's driving the dually from the ranch. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's up. That, that makes me feel at home right there. I'm down. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, these resorts are great. But it, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's, like, really unattainable for... Most people to go drop $180 on a lift ticket a day. for a day and then all the equipment and then all the shit. And then if you have kids and you want to, do, I'm just like, dude, how are we making this attainable for people? Like, this is something I've struggled with because I'm like, I'm trying to inspire people to not be able to afford what I do. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's like this love hate thing, you know, because I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's such an amazing experience as I've had and, and then I'm like, yeah, promote the backcountry. But I'm like, I don't want to send people the, the sheep to slaughter. Like, you, yeah. if you don't know what the what the fuck you're doing out there, you're going to die. Right. True. Well, and I'm glad you set me up for that. On an yeah, man. It is. Why, like on a board? You know? Like I got it on skis, but there's other things you need to pay attention to, like on a board or putting your board back together or where you stand Dude, or I how mean... you stand or why you would traverse here instead of there. You know, cause like on skis, it's, it's different. Like yeah. I can sit there and just do a couple of turns and it's like, ah, no big deal. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I, mean, I don't have to reset up my shit. I just have to yank the stuff off and it's just, it's different. And man, without the right instructors. Well, well yeah. Having, having the right crew of mentors mm-hmm. and people you learn under is critical with anything, but like, especially like, and that's why I'm like, I don't promote the backcountry If you've never, if you don't have any skills, I'm like, Hey, take an AVI one, do an AVI one, learn, learn trained management. <clears throat> Right. Don't be dumb. That's just what I tell people. Just don't be dumb. I guess most people's idea, there's people's idea of dumb is different than mine, but. Right. Well, I think that that's where, look, I'll go to the resorts and, you know, or we, we were up in Brighton, I think last year is where we did most of our Brighton. Skiing. Brighton's awesome. Because it's smaller. It's mellow. Right? It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it has a, such a good vibe. And yeah. This, that like you go to Park City. And Nightmare. dude, you park city in the wintertime. Uh, no offense. Uh, I, I actually, I don't really care if anybody's offended by it, but man, it's so, <laughs> so pretentious. Man. I mean, they have it's Sundance just, there, dude. Come on. They, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, like we went and ate dinner there one night, like all of us linked up and ate dinner there over the winter. And it's just like Range Rover, Range Rover, Range Rover, Audi, 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 yeah. Audi, Audi, it's just, Audi, it's Audi, tough, Audi, Audi. You're just I mean, like, like, what the? Rich people should. Man, it's Bright- rich people should. Brighton's great. Like, I live, yeah. you know, 15 minutes from from there, and, like, we were there the same thing, like, all winter. And it's great. Like, on a weekday, like, I think I was texting you. I'm like, you know, Tuesday yeah. morning or something. Right. 10 a.m. Up there. Parking lot's empty. Empty. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm literally yeah. parked 30 feet from the lift. Yeah. That's what's up. Like, it's fantastic, you know? Yeah. And, like, all the patrollers are great. All the lifties are awesome. They're telling you where the good snow is. Like, oh, dude, go up here. Go to, the, go to that run. That's where it's at right now. Like, it all got blown over there. That's what you want. That's, yeah. that's the place to be. Yeah. 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 If, you, more... if you show up and everybody's wearing an, an ABS airbag on their backs, you're just like, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that thing, dude? Like... Come on. Like, yeah. As you're making to, bad decisions. You know, like you're there in the parking lot at Brighton or what, just Snowbird yeah. or, a, or a Solitude, a sorry, solitude. just down the canyon. Yeah. You know, everybody standing at the lift line is in overalls and they're all having a drink or chilling out. No, that's where like, we were like, solitude. This, this, solitude. This is the yeah. shit. Like, this, is what yeah. I, this is what I like. And it's so funny because I went up there for the first time. My buddy V, uh, he, he lived out here for several years. He had CrossFit, Salt Lake, or Salt Lake City CrossFit. And um, I showed up here from Colorado, and I'd skied my way through Colorado. Like, I'd taken, like, six weeks off or something like that, and I went from hill to hill to hill to hill from, like, you know, Keystone and all these fucking... <laughs> yeah, all these, like, Colorado ski hills. And I got here, and we went up to, like, Solitude or Brighton. It was, like, small hill, tons of powder, and it was this... 
it was like after 18 inches, Lots like of 18 terrain. inches, yeah. like six hours or some shit. And it was the best skiing yeah. I'd ever had in my life. Then I went up through Idaho and into Washington and it got a little bit more wet, right? As I started getting closer yeah. to the, like yeah. a bit, like rainier. A bit. Yeah. Little, little damp out there. Good. <clears throat> this by far, like Utah, I skied Jackson Hole too. I think I skied the resort. Yeah. This by far was like yeah. the best ski day I think I'd had in my entire adult life. It was, it was the first time that I'd actually really skied powder. Like we'd been on powder mountaineering, but you got a fucking heavy rucksack on. You got skis. Not recreation. It's not fun, <laughs> man. It is like you, 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 you oh. stuck yourself into the snow and you're trying to wrestle your way out of this shit every time you, you know, every time you stick yourself in there. You're just surviving out You're there. just trying to survive. Yeah, you're not having any fun. Oof. But it was like doing this your best not to my, volunteer. I'm all about the way. fun. I, I I just I'm all about the fun, and I think it, it's an interesting thing with like the mountains and and the ego. And I watch it a lot. Like there's so much ego these days in the mountains, and there always has been. But I just think there's more people um, accessing them now, and it's just it's just really it's just not a good look. It's ugly. It's it's like that classic '80s movie where you got like the douchebag, like really pretentious rich guys. That Hot are dog, out there. yeah, like like those stupid fucking <laughs> yes. '80s movies. Where it's like you cruise up there. Oh, dude! Like, oh, I hate this place, man. I just got to get the there's fuck some rich out. people shit for yeah. sure. It's funny. Yeah, you just like like seeing people's whole program. You're like, oh man, you got a Porsche with a ski rack on top, huh? Is this really Solid happening? Move. You know, That's or, a BMW some, rear seems, wheel drive, right? <laughs> driving it into the snowy a, a mountains. Freaking G wagon, yeah. You know, with all the skis and all the shit on it. You're going, oh, man. see it all the time, man. Like it's it's uh, it, it, Jackson has really evolved. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Devolved I, places. Out I of could control. not. I did not realize how expensive <laughs> things were up there, and. I was just curious, not not as if I was looking at property whatsoever up there. I was just curious, like, whoa, what? Because you hear Jackson's like super expensive. So I hopped on Zillow and I was like, I got to see, like, well, Jackson, how can fucking Wyoming be so expensive? And it's just like 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollar houses. And there's a lot of them. Oh, bro. I'm it's going, like on like an acre. But I, I figured out why. Because I was like, I don't understand yep. why. I figured out why. You know why? Mm. no state income tax. Yep. So all these fucking rich people buy houses in Wyoming that yep. they never use and they declare, Wy declare Wyoming as their primary residence and yep. they avoid all state. Yep. They avoid state tax. Well, I mean, it's crazy. There's like, so there's like a full housing issue in Jackson, like all the employees, there's nowhere to live. Because not, they're not making any more land. How can they afford it? That's what I was asking. Well, they the guy live in, in Victor, in Alpine oh, that's South. Right. They live right they, outside. Well, God, it's man. still fucking right, hour right away, outside. Dude. No, I'm, like, I'm putting the quotes up there. Right out, yeah. It's and like so over that pass. All these houses are sitting there in Jackson. Empty. And they're empty. Yeah. And I'm like, we have a housing. I'm like, oh, man. It's just crazy. Isn't it's that just, where Kanye West just moved? Oh, no, he moved to Cody. Cody, okay. Yeah, Cody. He bought two ranches. He bought a ranch in Cody and a branch in uh, Shell. It's on the other Wyoming, side of the hills. Which is north of me, and I'm like, crazy. So Kanye's a rancher now? Well, I mean, so, it, he, I, he I owns don't a think couple he's ranches. a rancher. <laughs> I don't think Kanye will ever be a rancher, but he owns some ranches. I mean, maybe he will. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he wants to go get dipped in shit. I don't know. Maybe. I, hey, man, good on him. That'd be badass, though. I'd love to see Kanye out there, like, riding horses and roping and doing the whole thing. That'd Pro be pretty fucking proclaiming. sick. Proclaiming. <laughs> yeah. Putting on some, like, old worn-out weather gloves, like, building fence. Why not? Right? I'd Why love not? to see that. That would be I mean, pretty epic. Hey, man. Uh, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. So as you're... So we transition over to the, the meat co, mm. right? When we look at yeah. what you guys are doing. How many, how many head of cattle do you have between you and your dad? Well, we have, I mean, we have a lot of cows and the whole idea with this whole thing is to kind of like, not just be using our cattle. Right. So we have access in, in the Bighorn Basin alone, like nobody's cattle, like everybody's cattle are, are grazing on the same grasses. Like they're great cows. And so we want to be buying our neighbor's cows. We want to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, supplement them because the cow, beef market's in the shitter, man. Like beef farmer, like it's worth why, nothing. So why is that? 
I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, it's been devalued from um, all the importation of South American beef. Mm. You know, like they 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 deregulated um, country of origin stickers. Like, however, uh, in 2014, I think it was around. So it used to be product product of Brazil or whatever right. come on the package. Well, there's a, a the majority of the packing plants in the U.S. are owned by uh, Brazilians. Really? Yeah, South Americans, yeah. Wow. And so, you know, the minute that beef shipped up here and processed, product of America sticker uh, goes on it. So you don't know what beef you're getting. That's shiesty. Right. That's shiesty. Yeah, like that. yeah, it seems a little shiesty. So yeah. it devalues a lot of the ranchers. And who knows commodity? How's the stock market work? You know, it's like we're in a sh- – everything's in the shitter, but it's the stocks go up. I'm like, this is fucked up. So we want to create – our, and it's my brother's vision, man. Like he is like way, way beyond his years as far as his forward thinking and really creating a template for beef to be like, for ranchers to make money, get the money that they deserve for working with the animals. And right. like, cause you know, packing plants make a ton of money. The packers make, you know, $700, $800 a cow and they hold the cow for two weeks. The rancher right. holds a cow for his whole life and is, and is lucky to make a hundred bucks a cow. Wow. So it's like, it's just, there's no balance with it. So I think if you can set up a, a system where like, you know, we're buying our neighbor's cows and, and then this is, we want to be full, fully transparent with everything we're doing. We want people to set it up in, in their communities so they can like do the whole system. So basically we're trying to set that up intensely mm-hmm. and we're buying our neighbor's cows, um, and we just, yeah, we want to just make it mutually beneficial for everybody. There's a lot of amazing beef. We have enough beef in America. Yeah. Like we don't need to be importing a ton of shit, you know, but it's just somebody's lining their pockets. You know how it goes. And it's just yeah. uh, kind of shyster. Well, you and I were talking about this the other day where we were talking about the differences between things that are labeled grass fed and things that are actually grass fed, yeah. you know, how they taste different, how the fat looks different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, which, they're so, I mean, with any, any food, it's fully just smoke and mirrors. Right. You know, if you, if you can benefit from something being organic. Right. Which <laughs> USD is, labeled organic. Which is right. a paid for label, right? Does, you have does to go it through, mean it's or, like truly organic? Well, no, it's just sprayed with the USDA certified organic pesticides. Yeah. Right. It's not actually. <laughs> the mo- The best thing you can do is Buy local, buy from your right. local rancher. Yep. Like if you want to like, or hunt, mm-hmm. buy local, hunt, know where it comes from, shake the guy's hand that raises your beef. Like if you're believing the labels you're seeing in the grocery store, then you've been fooled already, mm-hmm. you know? And that and that's sad. It shouldn't be that way. But I think everybody's just so, so used to being screwed at this point, lied to, and especially within the food. I mean, that's that's all fucked up thing with everything that's going on, you know? Like our food system is so broken. Like we're feeding, we have soda and pop in schools for kids. Everybody's worried about COVID, but yet nobody's talking about nutrition and like immunity boosting and all this shit. I'm just like, they're like, stay away from everybody and wear a mask. I'm like, okay, that might be a Band-Aid for now, but like going into the future, there's more shit coming down the pipe. Like, how are we going to prevent that in the future? And it's not by being scared of everybody. It's by fucking, like, making everybody healthy. Right. You know? And, like, giving people that are creating that food, like, paying them in the value that it's deserved. It's not just, like, we, we're just, it's, everything seems to just have a Band-Aid duct tape all over everything mm-hmm. right now. And it's, like, we got to rip that off and, like, redo it. You know? So, I don't know how you do that, but I, I think baby steps. Yeah, I... I I think it's, I, I was thinking about this the other day because I think, you know, people have grown accustomed to uh, essentially buying things from large corporate entities that are really, they're more about the profit than they are the product, right? Because the profit is the product. That's the thing they're trying to manufacture. Yeah. So if you're trying to manufacture profit in a point or a two points of margin actually means something because that's what your objective is, you're going to do anything you can to achieve that outcome versus if you're about the product and the quality of the product, you have to sacrifice profit. It, you have to. 100%. And there's only limited circumstances. These are minority circumstances where you can not 
sacrifice the product for profit and being a direct to consumer business, that's what allows you to not sacrifice your product for the profit because you don't have three or four different middlemen in the middle of you and your customer. And I talk about this a lot with, uh, with, you know, our retailers and our retailer relationships because they're like, Oh, we, we need more margin. I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not going to give you more margin because I want to have that direct relationship with my customer. And more importantly, I don't want to sacrifice the product for the profit. So you can either sign up and do it or not. I don't give yeah. a fuck because this is our relationship with our customer. And if you want to be part of it, then great, you're going to make less money. But I'm not going to make less money on that because I can't sacrifice on my product. Yeah. To include, you know, one of the things that we, we've really tried to focus on the last year is building these relationships with farmers, you know, being less about the labels and more about the relationship, like who's growing the crop, who's growing the coffee, who is the farmer, you know, growing up and working in, uh, you know, with working on a farm. I worked on a farm in college. You know, the farm that I worked for, he, he was a fucking, one of the hardest working guys on the planet, probably one of the most honest and driven guys that I've ever been around. But if you told him that he was going to have to put a fucking organic stamp on his product in order to sell it, he would have told you to go fuck off. It's like, yeah, it's organic. Sure is. Like I go out and I feed those fucking cows every day, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, yeah. like, and I think... For us, you know, having that direct consumer relationship, being more concerned with the product than we are the profit, I think that is where we start to turn the corner. We have to take that the the big corporate entities out of this, the commodity traders, the guys that sit in fucking desks in high rises in New York, and you know, try to eke out a tenth of a fucking cent by screwing somebody over yeah, because they're doing it, fear. you know, yeah. fifty million times in one day. The, the commodities market, I've seen it in coffee. I've yeah. seen it in coffee. You know, there, there's no reason why the price of coffee set in the commodities market today is this low. And if people knew why it's this low and that you essentially have to hire slave labor in South American countries in order to meet the product demand and the price threshold for your crop and that they were supporting slave labor, I guarantee people would be like, not a problem. Let me pay an extra $3 a bag, man. Like, let me do it. Yeah. Or I just won't drink as much fucking coffee if I knew that, you know, nine-year-old kids were picking my fucking coffee yeah. and they were doing it for literally substance, like substance living. So I think for farmers of America, and, it, you know, get down off my soapbox for a second, but it's, you know, the, the way we do that is by building these brands that are these direct-to-consumer relationships where people know where their product comes from. You know, they... We did it when we were at TAC. We're shaking the hands of our customers. Yeah. We're talking, I was talking to a coffee club member that signed up for your membership Yep. Uh, that day. Totally. I remember. We were sitting there and he's like, I'm a coffee club subscriber and I subscribe to, you know, Carter Meats too. And he goes, I, I love this, that I can sit here and I can talk to you and shake your hand. I guarantee how many... How many guys from these large corporate entities are shaking the hands of their customers on a regular fucking basis? Because they don't give a fuck. They really don't. They're concerned about profit. Now, I'm not saying you can't, like you have to be concerned about profit in order to run a successful business. But I've purposely said, I don't give a shit about the grocery stores. Purposely said that, I'm bypassing them. I don't like going into meetings with guys that are wearing, you know, pleated front dockers with <laughs> fucking button up shirts telling me that they know more about my customer than I do. They can fuck off. They don't know shit. They know how to run a grocery store. That's what they yeah. know how. They have no idea how to build a brand. They have no idea how to build like quality and a relationship with their customers. These grocery stores are concerned with fractions of a fractions of a fractions of a dollar. They're playing a game of just like, mass gross volume and trying to get an extra 10 or 15 cents per product and then get more things into one specific cart. They're trying to get more shit into a cart. Well, that's not the game I want to play. I, why would I want to play that game with my customer? That's just a fucking horrible, horrible game versus your model, my model, direct to the consumer. And that's talking. exactly how you ended up with 
shitty products. Yeah. Right? Like subsidizing corn syrup, subsidizing yep. and allowing for shit coffee at bad prices, subsidizing crap beef coming from places, even if it is good, mm -hmm. subsidizing stuff coming from outside so that they can sell it at a higher margin and make not – like they're not cutting into profit, they're cutting into their more profit. Correct. The issue is they're already making a profit. They want more of a profit. Right. That's the problem. It's not well, nobody's yeah, telling business owners you can't make a profit. It's no, no, no. We want to make more. Well, more, that's what I always more. Like, more. That's more the hard is part the issue. about like the the corporate structure is it's like it's never enough. It's never enough. Like yeah. every year they're like, well, we got to with more, it, like more, if it's more, not more. doing this, then it's not good enough. And I'm like. Well, what if you get here and it's a fuck ton of money? That's still not good enough. We still got to, like, I didn't never understood that. You know, I was like, all right, but you got all these guys sitting around tucking their shirts in, talking about <laughs> they want to make more money so that they can spend more money. But, but then when they spend more money, they need to make more money to pay for the things they already spent. And they screw the guys that are actually doing all the work on the ground. Precisely. Yeah. Well, oh, and I think a lot of that, you know, the entire. Uh, and, and not as if I'm not a capitalist in the truest sense of like building organizational yeah. structure, growing businesses, because I believe in growing businesses. I just believe in growing them the right way. And when every time you're dealing with, it, it, if people just understood like the banking industry controls everything, right? So they control the purse strings to it, literally everything that happens within America, right? So that for every $1, they can loan out 10. They only have to have a 10 or $1 in their bank and they can loan out fucking 10, yeah. $10. So their game is to get, you know, more dollars so they can loan out more dollars, right? That's, that's their fucking game, more money. So the game of the industry that controls industry is to have more. So when, to your point, you know, if we're trying to scale businesses the correct way and we're dealing with these fucking guys in the banking industry that they're like, well, you just don't have enough money. Well, you have 10, you have, you have $1. You don't make anything, man. You're taking other people's money and you're just converting that money into more money. And how we got ourselves into this, this situation where the banking industry itself has so much power over what we do in America and American industry which is another whole soapbox. I apologize, guys. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, the problem is, is the pleated front fucking docker wearing shiny cuff link fucktards in New York have too much authority over what happens in American business. So I will thank Silicon Valley and I will thank the United States government for making the fucking internet because it's essentially taking away portions of their power and we, they're, they're allowing us when I say they, our customers are allowing us to have this fucking incredible experience with them again because industry and the growth fucking brokers and you know corporate executives and commodities guys have taken some of the power away. So you have these massive corporations that are chasing fractions of a fucking penny. I mean, J Jeff Bezos made $16 billion in one day. <laughs> <laughs> in one day. And I'm not saying making money is bad whatsoever, but I'm saying like Jeff Bezos also owns the fucking Washington Post. He controls a huge amount of information. He, you know, the, these guys that- I guess he's currently worth 189 billion with a B. With a B, <sighs> right? So to your point, like when is it- <laughs> Just trying to think about how much uh, you money my brain that is. hurts. My brain hurts, man. My brain hurt, hurts thinking about it because as a guy that's a capitalist, I think that, there's a difference though. That would take at the current US median salary, that would take five point two thousand years or something to make. Yep. It's something insane. Did you just do that the, math the, in your head? No, I, I saw Jesus a, a graph of it earlier. Oh I know what you're keeping around. I Trevor, you are in the wrong <laughs> position, my friend. <laughs> you, you need to do something in math. Evan, I was, I was the Navy. You know I do math like a one, two, ten. <laughs> hey, I got guys, ten. Seven. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, myself. oh man it's a fairly easy solution to figure this stuff out right like we've we've been saying this saying for a while now but vote with your dollar like you just as consume we're all consumers taking an extra step in our process of getting whatever goods that we're buying and figuring out exactly where those coming from you know the the made in america movement has been really strong now for yep. for a number of years but 
so much, so many people, you you just kind of run out of time. You don't you don't have enough there to like figure out where it is and what a potential relationship you can have with the people providing your goods. Just taking a little bit more time to figure that out. Like, oh, I need I need some meat to fill my freezer. Like, I'm either going to hunt now or I'm I'm going to you know look up Carter Country Meats and, yeah. and see what these guys are all about. Like, it's really not that difficult to like move past this. And it's just, you know, like back to like, you have to spend a little bit more. The consumer has to spend a little bit more for that product, you know, but it trickles down to the guy that's like But when you're spending a little bit more and you're being conscious about that kind of effort, you're probably going to have that trickle down into the rest of your life, right? So you're not going to be buying other crappy products that would be eating into the cash flow that you'd need to purchase a subscription to a company that makes sense, Right. You know, if you're looking at healthier options that are also from a direct consumer, say like from from the ranch, right? So you, you subscribe to Carter Country. Now you have really good beef that's going to taste better. You're not going to buy bulk loads of crappy beef. Well, you're probably also not going to buy other crappy food. So now you can pay for that. Yeah. yeah. And you're not being, you know, and you're not supporting the burning of the rainforest, yeah. no, man. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. like you're contributing <laughs> to other good yeah. shit. And then you're going to start examining other things in your life. Like I've heard people say like, oh, you know, that's expensive or I can't do this or say like for the coffee, coffee subscription, like, oh, you know, that's a little bit expensive. Like, yeah, but, you know, instead of contributing to Starbucks, having crappy stuff come from crappy places, you know, with crappy people, you, how about you cut out drinking for a month? <laughs> All of a sudden now you have right. a shit ton of cash to bring in and, you know, now your your life's healthier. And what's your, yeah, what's your health worth? Exactly. You know, what is your body? It's only your health. No big deal. Mm. It's you only know, the only body you're ever going to have. Yeah, like, and no given worries, our dog. current predicament, the, I would say that's probably the most important thing we should be thinking about 100%. right now. It's like, I need to put shit in my body that's going to maintain a healthy immune system and it's the most allow important me to thrive. Thing to think about <laughs> always. Unless you want to die. Well, I, well, we're all in the same race to the same finish line. We we're all, we're all going to die, but do you want to feel good between now and then? Yep. Well, I do want to invest in, you know, you want to invest in sustainable farming practices yeah. and yeah. sustainable healthy products. Sure. And those are the things where, you know, I've, I've had these conversations with people and they, they've talked to me about, well, you know, this coffee is a lot cheaper. I'm like, it's a way inferior product. It's it's not even close. We're we're not talking about the same type of product. You're talking about something that is down all the way down at like grade D with you know different partic different particulate in it that's not even coffee, uh, and you're supporting non sustainable farming practices, slave labor. You know, your your multinational you're, conglomerates. You're you, in a lot of these things. They're they're not publicly traded companies, so you're not even benefiting stockholders. You're supporting a large holding company in Germany or Switzerland or something like that to make an extra fucking billion dollars a year versus buying American made, knowing who's producing your product. And I I, I get it, right? We're, things are tight right now too for a lot of people. Like they're they are tight and people need to be price sensitive and things like that. They do. Like I, I absolutely a hundred percent am empathetic to that, but to the point what people need to be more concerned with, I think now is how healthy they are, like how this machine is running because it's going to be really difficult if you're filling it full of alcohol and fucking cigarette smoke and really shitty food for that machine to actually work hard and compete <laughs> yeah. on the job market. Well, yeah, it, I, uh, it, it, if you're being price sensitive, right? Like by eating healthier, being healthier, you're actually going to end up taking less supplements, mm -hmm. not being on prescription drugs. And the more you do that sort of stuff, you're going to start examining other ways yeah. to get all of your food for cheaper, working out at home. Like, do you need a phone? Really? Do you really do you need, need a an TV? Eye? Do you really need a TV? Do you really need some of the stuff that, Eventually, you start turning your life over to a healthier lifestyle and you will be living cheaper and purchasing more expensive food if you're purchasing food. But you I, will be living cheaper. I came into the house the other day and uh, I was like, I was looking for the remote because I was going to turn the TV on. And I was like, well, when's the 
where's the remote? My wife's like, TV hasn't worked for like three weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to go. It's okay. Totally okay with that. <laughs> got it. Sounds yeah, good to me. I went and got a Corona test over the weekend. <laughs> corona. Which I'm negative. Just throwing that out yeah, there. Yeah, you are. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I was, one, I was like really taken aback by how many people were getting tested <sighs> in, in one single day. Like there was probably... Uh, you know, in the how long the, were you in line? Probably an hour and a half. Oh, yeah, it was two hours. Like, two hours for me. Yeah, f- oh, three, four hundred people in God. there, and you know, you're moving your vehicle through the course to get to the tents where they're doing the the nose swab. And I look to my right in this car, and there's this female in there, and she's just ripping her vape like every the five douche minutes. Flute? Hell yeah, <laughs> and douche like, flute. I like that. Yeah. Like, how do you not see the conundrum of what you're doing where this disease impacts your lungs and then you're just sucking this stuff up and then you're letting it mix out and you're just blowing it in front of everybody that's getting uh, that Corona test. And I'm just like, oh man, like this. But that's kind of like, you know, I'm not too surprised that that was happening. If you don't care, it doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. I, I think a, a lot of this has shown me just how fucking stupid and hypocritical people are. Like this, 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 this the last couple of months of this is just yep. like, man, you guys are, you're, you're not you guys on the show. I'm just saying, like, man, there are a lot of fucking really dumb people. It's that meme that was that was out and is circulating where there's this so this obese person that's like cruising around in one of those scooters and she's got McDonald's cup in her thing and there's this person running that without a mask and she's like. You put on your mask, you're affecting my health. <laughs> it's like, man, this is such the time that we live in where we can't even talk about how this this is affecting and what is the high risk category of person because we can't fat shame people. And it's like, no, if you're fat, I apologize, you know, but get off your ass and do something about it. I mean, it, it's, it, it sounds callous, and I know there are a lot of people out there who would disagree with me in the sense of like, well, I can't do anything about it. And it's like, you know what? You can do something about it. You can choose not to put things in your face. Like, you can. Like, I grew you, up in You a, will literally do less work because you're not eating as much. Like, it doesn't cost anything to walk. You can still walk outside, I think, in this <clears throat> pandemic. You can still You can eat keep, the inside doing lunges. I don't... I don't typically eat till like one o'clock, yeah. one thirty. Same with Trevor. Me you know, too. When I eat, I'm typically eating like wild meat because I've been very fortunate to fucking kill things that I can eat. Like I can eat less. I lost seventeen pounds during this fucking thing, man. Like I chopped it off, not because I'm lucky, because I just stopped putting things in my face and I moved my body more. Like I think I'm down like eight. Right, and you had a ton to lose, uh, uh, Trevor. So like, yeah, you so, are you are a total fat ass, Trevor. Jesus. But the excuse driven society of a bunch of people that literally are high risk. Yeah. They're smoking. They're obese. They take in really horrible amounts of food. As far as like they overeat, they overeat the wrong foods, and they have the same access to the internet that everybody else does. When he's like, well, there is a small percentage of people in the United States that don't have access to the internet. I understand that. But it has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with income. It doesn't really have, there's zero to do with whether or not you can go to the fucking public library and get on the goddamn internet and research like healthy food options and how to lose weight and basically go out and lose weight. And I mean, we're I, only a generation and a half away from people literally eating direct from farmers. You know what right? the, like that's not that, do you know what the like, average weight of the American service member was in World War II? Nope. What was it? One one forty. It was like one fifty five or something like that. That was the average weight. You know what the average height was? Six. Foot? No, it was five ten. Five ten. Five ten. A hundred and fifty five fucking like, pounds. Bro. I saw my granddad. Like we talked about yeah. him, uh, you know, a few months ago. My granddad's entering weight into the Marine Corps in forty three. I think he was like six one and like one sixty two. Yeah. What's the average now? It's something like it, it's, it, it's something like they're turning people away for being too correct. fat. That's what it's like. It's gone up thirty pounds. I'd like to know what the, the average statistic on turnaround is. Like, how many people are they turning away? Wow. Well, yeah, and then but it's gone up thirty plus. The average weight of the enlistee is thirty plus pounds more than it was in the nineteen <clears> forties, <throat> and that was two. We we are two gens removed that is from that. Absolutely insane. No, it's 
fucking crazy. Like literally, that's insane. And for people not to be able to say that, like, hey, uh, eat less, move your body more, and you can lose weight. You don't even have to eat less. Eat better. Like, yeah. Like pro- processed foods are the cause for the bulk of people being hospitalized. Period. Yeah. That, like, the end result, all this shit, all these autoimmune disorders, all the overweight issues, hypertension, yeah. heart disease, heart it disease. can all get linked right on back to sugar, processed food. But we can't talk about those things, right? We so as, as a society, we can't talk about how is it, how can we make ourselves healthier, increase our immunity to the COVID issues? How can we do this? We can't talk about that. Well, it's crazy to me. You got to lock yourselves in a fucking house. You got to wear a mask. Inside. Inside, you know, inside your car by yourself like a fucking D-bag. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. With right? your uh, douche flute? With your, yeah, flute. huffing <laughs> on your pipe. I, and then if you go to a public place, you can take your mask off if you're putting if you've been substances allowed, if in you've your been fucking allowed mouth. allowed inside. Yeah. I, yeah, it... I don't even know what to say, you know? You're just like... I don't either. Uh, it's an it's a, it's a incoherent just jibber-jabber at this point across the spectrum because now it's, 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 it's somewhat political and, you know, whether, whether, where, whether masks work or they don't work and whether or not, like, some drugs work or they don't work. And it's like, you know what's free? Uh, exercise and exercise air. Exercise and air, man. It's fucking free. Go do that. For now. All right. Well, Mark, thanks, hey, man. Hey, good chat. Great chat. Thanks for having me. Check out where, hey, where can everybody find you, man? Um, Carter Country Meats. Dot com. Dot com. Carter, Carter Country, Country Meats. Meats. Yeah, yeah. We have and Instagram, then, Carter Country, Carter Country Meats. And then, yeah, we have a website. What's your, what's your Instagram? Carter Country. Carter Country. Yeah. And nice. we're doing uh, like subscription based stuff on the the internets what's on your like best seller ship, ship what, what, once a week what's bro. your what's your good deal uh we have Yo. the bighorn boxes we do five ten twenty pounds okay ship wow. direct to your door and we're shipping in all uh biodegradable biodegradable insulin nice. so really trying to uh and then we also do like a collab with yeti on a premium package you can get Super a yeti cool. cooler yeah so yeah just trying to do it right man less cool. waste is better yeah well check it out Cool. Carter Country Meats. Thanks, man. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, fellas.